Adam and Eve did walk with him in the shade of those trees as they fellowshiped him. That fellowship must have not lasted long. You know the rest of that story. The fall was great, and it's been a long ways back. Job knew that he lived. Abraham was his friend. Moses knew he was standing on holy place by that burning bush. God was just warming them up because he saw his hinder parts on Mount Sinai. We got in closer. Amen. The prophets knew a lot about him, but not perfectly. Even Paul said he knew a man that went there, but he couldn't talk about it. Gabriel stands in his presence, waiting his bidding. The thought is eyeball to eyeball. I'd like to see that. I intend to see that. There's four beasts surrounding that throne, praising him. Twenty-four elders crowned with gold, dressed in white, praising him endlessly. Our Savior there on the right hand, ruling and reigning till he makes all of his enemies his footstool. The Spirit in all of its manifold glory is there. The Spirit and the bride say, Come. Is anybody interested? Well, that's what I've been assigned this morning to talk to you, illuminate the way. In Scripture called the new and living way. The text is not Jeremiah 31. It is Hebrews 10, 19. Will you read with me? Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we possess, profess, for he who promised is faithful. Amen. Therefore, my brothers, if you are interested in heaven, If you would like to see what Adam had restored, if you would like to see even greater glory than that, this way is called the new and living way. Now I want you to note very quickly, as was illuminated yesterday, the writer here says it was open for us, not by us. See, that just solves that all right right there. We don't have to worry about that any longer it was open for us. Now, of course, it said how that far was by his blood through his body. And here it was called a new and living way. As we started our reading here by therefore, I thought I'd check and see what it was there for. And so I went back 18 verses. I could have gone back further, but in the first 18 verses, it referred to Christ 18 times. I thought that was interesting. Of course, it referred to him in other ways, in an indirect way. So I know here we're talking about the opening being by Christ. I could sit down and rest my case, but we'll go on. This chapter is about how he opened it for us. And of course, I find that interesting, and I think we should dwell on that some later on. He opened it. By the way, on his way to heaven to open it, John 14, there was an interesting question come up. Now, on his way to open it, incidentally, or not incidentally, that led through the cross. And not incidentally, if you intend to go there, 
it'll lead you to your cross also. Amen. There was a question that arose in one of his disciples' minds on his way to opening heaven. How do I know the way? Well, there's some other questions that had to be asked, answered first, but once they got all those answered, then the question arises. As well, it should in thinking man. How do I know the way? Oh, Thomas, I am the way. Amen. Oh, doubting humanity, I am the way, says Christ. Amen. Oh, Pharisee, I am the way. Oh, religious legalist, I am the way. Oh, sectarian, I am the way. Oh, Church of Christ, I am the way. Oh, disciples, Christian church, I am the way. But I am more than the way. I am the truth and the life. Now, I am the way. Hebrews 10 explains why he could be the way. Because I have come to do your will. Amen. Amen. And by that will, you. Oh, I like to be you every now and then. Have been made holy. Amen. See, the way... The way to God has to be the one of holiness. That's the reason he could no longer walk with Adam. Holiness had been lost. Now I have been made holy by Jesus doing his will. That way he could be just as well as justify. Now he goes on and says, But I am more than the way. I am the truth. Because it is a fact. That he is the only one that came to do his will. Amen. Now that's the elementary truth of scripture. Amen. For there was none other that did his will. But, so therefore not only is he the way, he's the truthful way. But he is life. The life giving way. For without the truthful way... <laughs> There could have been no life given. So not only is he the way, he's the truthful way, he's the life-giving truthful way, he is the new and living way, I rest my case. Anything else I have to say, I hope does not be dim that fact. But I see by the clock on the wall, I have a few minutes left. But I don't want to be dim that fact. John, that great herald of the coming truth, said, cried out, Law came by Moses, but tr grace and truth by Jesus Christ. Therefore, illuminating the two ways, ordained of God to reach him. Now, we're not talking about everybody else out in the world. We're talking about people that try to get to God by law or by grace and truth. First was law. Second, grace and truth, as it was mentioned by John. Now these are two ways of relating or two ways of getting to the presence of God. Now Hebrews 10 addresses this in the ninth verse. When Jesus, the, the writer says, in one fell swoop, he sets aside the first, the law, to establish the second. My first question was, that, was that an edict? No, that was not an edict. That was an act. Amen. God didn't arbitrarily say that, nor Jesus arbitrarily say that. That was an act of obedience by the Son of God, by all that He did according to our Scripture in His body, through the curtain. One act of an obedient life. And yet, willing to give that and suffer all the penalties that law required, He suffered in His body on that cross 
And so that way, he set aside the first to establish the second. He set it aside, of course, by fulfilling it. Therefore, if it was ever a legitimate way to reach the presence of God, it has been fulfilled in Christ. Law. And therefore, forever, you and I only have the possibility of grace and truth. Amen. So God will not care to try to relate to you through law today. That depends upon the strength and the faithfulness of flesh, which will not happen except in Christ, except by Christ. Grace and truth, on the other hand, depends upon the strength and faithfulness of God. And He is faithful who promised. Now that was also in our reading this morning. Do we need to go back and reread that? You can read it later. It's all right there. Now what are we to do with this bold assertion by John that truth is coupled with grace and not coupled with law? Well, your first reaction would be, well, is law not true? God forbid, of course. It was holy, just, and good. It's given by God to Moses, angels present. However, as we have understood well from yesterday, the fault was in us. But our, con our overall context in the 10th chapter of Hebrews sheds additional light on this. 10.1, the law is only a shadow. Now my question is this, can a shadow produce reality? Well, I know it can, but scriptures illuminate that. The law is only a shadow of good things. It is not the reality themselves. Amen. Now, when Jesus asserted that he was the truth, by the way, the law came by Moses. Mm -hmm. Now, Moses wasn't the law. Grace and truth came by Christ Jesus, but Jesus was the truth. Amen. A vast difference yeah. Amen. in this yeah. whole situation. Yeah. Now, when Jesus asserted that he was the truth, that means he is the real thing. And ironically, as he is the truth, he only, he's the true light that gives light in whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. When you look at Jesus, you can never see a shadow. That means you can't get deflected by, you know, this morning I walked and my shadow started bothering me. When I'm in Christ... There is no shadow Amen. to Amen. deflect Amen. my mind. Shadows would cause too many a person to run off the ditch. And when you are involved in law, which it is, you are in the ditch and it's very confusing. Now Moses presented figures of truth. But they were only figures of truth. Tabernacle, temple, sacrifice, ritualistic ceremonies given only to a natural man. And I conclude from this, since human nature really, in the Adamic nature really hasn't changed, anyone caught up in tabernacle, temple, sacrificial, ritualistic ceremonies are pretty well following the natural man. But it can, in that sense in which Moses gave it, God was demonstrating to his fleshly creation, he does want a fellowship. And natural man grasped that. So it was needed. But law never quite grasped the reality that it foreshadowed. And it's, it's in the background. There Jesus was all the time. You know, he's that rock out there. He's that cloud. He's there all the time, but they never could quite grasp the real thing. But in due time, he came. Now God did write on tables of stone. That a natural man could see with natural eyes. Now that's the old dead way. And I know it's a dead way. Nearly about anybody that ever looked at it, or at least a lot that looked at it, died. Mm -hmm. Gives new teeth to the letter killeth. God once spoke from heaven, but he did it to natural ears. Mm -hmm. 
How many received salvation from him speaking to the natural ears? Name them. It was not the law at fault again. The natural man could not receive it. Now I know something has changed. I know it has to have changed. Because I heard all day yesterday that God writes his laws in the heart of man. That he speaks to heaven, to spiritual ears. But I also know the scriptures teach the things of God knoweth no man. That natural man cannot receive the Spirit of God. What has changed? Well, I do know this, that law is not a substitute for what has changed. Law becomes an offense to the cross. For a man that tries to approach God by law has negated the cross, and that's an offense to God. As a matter of fact, it's an offense to me. Somebody said yesterday that our legalists, our friends, are not our friends. In that sense, I understand it. It's an offense to the cross. So it's not an arbitrary statement that the man made. There's a basis for it. In this sense, it's a lie. That's why truth is not coupled with law. And it's a big lie. They say the world will fall for a big fight. And the world has fell for it. We all fell for it. You see, law and the old covenant, we need to discuss it even today, though Moses' law was given to those 12 tribes. Now I know this because Paul over there in Corinthians, talking to basically a bunch of Gentiles, recounted Moses going up on Sinai. And taking those tables of stone. And getting so close to the presence of God. That the glory overwhelmed him to the people. Could not look at him. Without that veil separating uh, them from him. But Paul goes ahead and says. Now if you'll just get in Christ. That veil will be taken away. There's something horrible about discussing going to God with a big veil in front of you. That hurts. In Christ, it's taken away. In through the body of Christ, that is taken away. Now, I know these things are, uh, again, important because in Galatians, Paul's allegory of those sons of Abraham, you remember Ishmael and Isaac, he gave an allegory here of the old covenant relating to Ishmael, and the new covenant, that is the new way, relating to Isaac. One after the flesh, one after the spirit, telling us to cast out the old, telling us to be sons of the free woman. Who's he talking to, a bunch of Jews? No, he's talking to Gentile people. He's talking to them about law versus truth and grace. Grace and truth. We need our, we have made every mistake the Jewish people make. Don't laugh at them. Consider yourselves. We are bothered with the same problems that the Jewish nation was bothered at. Law, then, to me, is not just dispensational back there as to time, it's dispensational to my experience. I've experienced the same thing they experienced. And the whole world does. And I'm talking about thinking man. There is no thinking man that wants to go to God that it hadn't crossed his mind that he will try to approach by law. It happens to us. It happens nearly every day to us. And we need to constantly be on guard of this. Now, but law was, back a little further, law is given to a natural man. Adam was a natural man. God gave him a law. It didn't work, of course, as we found out last night. The descendants of Adam, the Jewish people, received a law. But that law appealed to their natural self, their behavioral self, as it was brought out yesterday. And law demonstrated the epitome of the natural, fleshly, earthly man at work. It brought him to nothing. That's what law eventually will do. And we, it has been explained to you that a new law 
was not needed. If, if it was a harder law, you would just fall faster. If it was an easier law, what kind of God is, is that type of respecter? Uh, it, it just doesn't make sense that a new law... In fact, if we had a new law, we'd just be guilty in a new light. It's still all guilty. Amen. What's needed? A new man. Amen. A new man is what's needed, not a new law. And praise God for 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Amen. Amen. Okay, you can call him a new creature too if you want to. But he is a new creation. In Christ, we have been altogether made into a new creation. Amen. Now, let me tell you what that's not. That's not an improvement of your old self. Amen. That's why the behavioral differences don't work. Amen. We're not improving your behavior. God says, I'm going to make you a new man. Identity in Christ is to kill the old man. Amen. That's Romans 5 and 6. Amen. Our righteousness then in Christ is not, has nothing to do with the righteousness of the old man. The old man was crucified. You can't make the old man righteous, live or dead. Crucified. Now Paul spent most of his time contrasting these two men. The old man and the new man. It's replete with these comparisons. Put off the old. Crucify the old. Put on the new. For that's where life is. That old man, he was in Adam as a father. Oh, this new man, this second man, he is in Christ. The first man is of earth, earthly. Mortal, dying. The new man has a quickening spirit, life-giving spirit. That sounds like a new way to me, a live way. It's heavenly, being made fit for heaven, incorruptible. Sensual is the old man. Spiritual is the new man. In this old is where sin has its domain. It don't mean everything that happens in Adam is a sin. It just means sin can operate there. Amen. I told that to one guy. He says, "You mean those trees out there are sin?" I says, "I says they're." He said, "They're natural." I says, "Yeah, I'll cut one down, burn it for firewood, build your house with it, and takes what's left and make you a." statue and bow down and worship it. Of course, sin operates in the scene. If you enjoy it with your senses, don't enjoy it too much because it will not be in heaven. That is consigned to the dustbin of this earth and will be destroyed. The old bears witness of the earthy. The new bears witness of the heavenly. The old has the human nature. The new has the divine nature. Amen. In fact, just to take my old man and try to get rid of the sins and give me a new law is the most ridiculous thought that I've ever had. Uh, you know, the corrupt tree just keeps producing corrupt fruit. And that's what I would produce. So God's plan is to take the axe to it. Uh, kill it. Get it out. Chop it down. So God doesn't, then God doesn't focus on behavioral changes. He focuses on crucifying the source of the bad behavior. Amen. Now there's lots of people that do focus on this. Physicians do. I notice they focus on my bad habits and I pay them good money for that. And I don't even fuss about it too much. Now, and I note the psychologists and the psychiatrists, they really focus on this. And, you know, I suppose sometimes I can even have a, a twinge of sympathy for their plight. But I'll tell you one thing that I don't have any sympathy for. The pulpits focus on it. Behavioral changes. Preachers focus on it. Behavioral changes. God focuses on killing it. Amen. Burying it. Rise it. Let it rise again as a new life in Christ Jesus. Now I do want to focus on a peculiarity of this new creation. Of this new way. In it there is no pride. 
Why is that? Because it takes I to have pride. You, there is no pride unless there's I. I has been crucified. Amen. The life that remains is not I. It is Christ. Amen. The hope of glory. Christ in me, the hope of glory. My will becomes His. His desire has overtaken mine. Now, there's no question about this new man. He is a new creation. And there's no question that Jesus was the first of that creation. I'm glad the scripture said that. Revelation 3.14 said he's the beginning of the creation of God. Now that's the new creation. Uh, now the, he was the last Adam. He was the end of the old and the beginning of the new. In him we have both the destruction of the old man and the birth of the new. Now it's interesting from God's perspective. He sees the old man is dead. Do you? We don't see it enough. There is where the problems arise in our life. Paul pleaded, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to Christ. In our experience, we simply do not grasp it enough. We simply do not see as perfectly as God sees, which creates in us all manner of havoc in our lives. And Paul addressed this. I'm glad the speakers yesterday addressed this. He wrestled with it. Romans 8, 2 Corinthians 5. Such statements as I died daily. I continue to put off the flesh. I continue to put on the new man. I like what John the Baptist said. I must decrease, let him increase. Now that's a good summation of the old way versus the new. You decrease. Get rid of the old way. Let him increase. That's the new and the living way. Now this is necessary. Now I'll tell you why it's necessary. Because God is not going to take both. Amen. He cannot use both. The old man and the new man. Amen. He makes a distinction, a separation of them. Now there's a context in Luke the 17th chapter that um, it's a controversial text uh, in the 20th verse to the 37th verse about the coming kingdom, all the events that take place surrounding it. But personally, my attention is drawn far more to rather than to the controversies about when it's going to happen and all that to the ones that are accepted in that kingdom. Now, I found that, that interesting I, because I'd like to be in it. And in verse 33, to where my attention it drawn, is drawn, it says, Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will save it. Well, that can be arresting language. It is arresting language to the man in Adam. That will make no sense at all. But to the new man in Christ, well, now that makes perfect sense. But then the next statement, he says, two are in the field, or two are in the bed, one taken, one not. Two at the grind uh, mill, grist mill, one taken, one not. Two in the field, one taken, one not. Now, I just like to think of myself as two in the bed. One says, how? Well, I am, I was a man in Adam. I am a new creature in Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus took, God took the new man in Christ. He left that man in Adam. Amen. Now I like to think about me as the two at the grind mill. I have related to God by law. I am relating to God by grace and truth. Amen. Now God takes the one relating to God by grace and truth. He leaves the other unfit. I like to think of me as the two men in the field. One, I was on the old dead way, but now I am on the new and living way. God takes the one on the new and living way. He leaves the one on the old and dead way. Now all left is consigned to the dust heap of earth, which of course will be destroyed. Now, 
practical considerations. God has forever divided and separated these two men, these two systems, these, if you want to call it systems, uh, these two creations. Now, to the extent that I do not experience what God has separated, I become a double-minded man. And I'll be unstable in all my ways. And the church is full of them. Now, I'm not going to pick on the atheist, the bum, the whatever that doesn't even want a relationship to God. I just pray for them. But I'm talking to us that are relating to God. The church is full of people that are double-minded. They cannot understand the new creation. If you don't understand the new creation, you cannot understand the new covenant. Amen. If you don't understand the new creation, it will plague you forever how God can write His law in your hearts and minds. He did not write it into the old man. He did not straighten you up in your behavior to put it in there. He created in Himself a new man. And by faith, you crucify that old man and rise to walk as a new man. And it is in that new man that he, the Spirit can operate. Amen. That Spirit is not at work in the old man. It, the old man is dead. Why does the Spirit want to operate in that? Operate in the new man where fruit can be produced. Amen. And that fruit of the Spirit is bountiful. You will have a wonderful harvest. But a man that does not see this but is double-minded and heads for the psychiatrist often. I'm ashamed to tell you that in San Angelo, Texas, there is a home for people with mental illness. The Church of Christ is the number one inmate, if you want to call them that. I hadn't checked up here. It may be the Christian church is the number one inmate. I don't know. But I will tell you the church is full of double-minded men. The problem is they haven't made the division that God has made. Amen. Now, when that old man was crucified, it wasn't separating my good from my bad. No, it was not separating my good from my bad. It, in truth, there wasn't any good in me. Or whatever was there, sin could corrupt. So, he just crucified that all. Now, this is the way we think of God operating. Just kind of, you know, you know, God's not through with me yet. He's just straightening me out. We're going to get this behavior. He's just separating the good from the bad and this type of thing. While there are elements of I suppose truth there, it just doesn't lead to a clear understanding. In truth, there was no good in that's Romans 1 through 3. Paul spent a lot of time explaining that. I don't know why we get it confused. He took the whole of myself, all of my Adam, Amen. crucified it on that cross. Amen. Oh, what a sacrifice. Oh, what a gift and created a new man in Christ. That leaves only Christ. Now at this point, I must tell you what you already know, but you may not have a clear thinking about it. The cross's greatest enemy is self-preservation of Adam. That is the, the enemy of the cross. Self-preservation of Adam. Now, how does that play itself out in the average professed Christian's life? Again, I'm not talking about those that don't care. I am talking about those that do care about the cross of Christ. Here's the way it happens. I will do five things to get into the way. 
I will hear, I will believe, I will repent, I will confess, I will be baptized, I will go to church, I will hear the word of God taught, I will sing songs, I will give, I will pray, I will partake of the Lord's communion, I will study when I get home, I will change my behavioral uh, things that are bad. I will grow in statue. I will defend the faith. I will defend our sect. I will rise in the ranks. I will be a deacon. I will be an elder. I will be a bishop. I will be a pope. I will rise to that which is above God and above all which can be worshipped. I will won't work. Now, some of us didn't have even enough will to do a good job. Don't fuss about the Pope. Fuss about yourself. We all got an I will worship type attitude. It is the biggest enemy of the cross. The church's enemy is us. I didn't mean to step on toes unless they needed to be stepped on and then I really meant to stomp them. <laughs> Thank the Lord God recognizes a new creation. Amen. He loved his son. He knew that he was the beginning of a creation and he loves all that are in him. And the Spirit is working mightily, mightily in me at this moment. He's worked in me already today. He work, has to work in me every day to get this I will out of the way. Now, you know, we, we say self-preservation is a mighty strong instinct. And it is the devil knew where to get us. And even I have said, well, it's still working because I'm going to get saved anyway. No, it's not I that was saved. It was the new man that was saved. When I say that, I was in Adam. I said it in Adam. I said, I've outfoxed him. I got him to save me. He crucified me and created a new man in Adam, uh, in Christ. Now, though I don't always comprehend it, the Spirit sheds light to me daily. I thank Him for that. Now, this way is called a living way. And it's also called a new way by the Spirit. Now, I heard a man say yesterday, well, it's new in any way you want to think about it. And I'd say amen to that. I believe I did say amen to that. And I don't want to... Uh, I, I just found this fascinating. I have to share it with you. And if I'm not right, then maybe you can correct me. I just knew when it said new way, it was talking about the same new as when it said new covenant. And I was wrong. Amen. I was wrong. Uh, well, I said, maybe it's just new as to time. But I was wrong there too. It's a rarely used new in the scriptures. A freshly made way. Incorporating all ideas of new. New as to kind, new as to time in that sense. Freshly made. It's as if John, on that Rocky Island of Patmos first looked into heaven. First the door was open, and as he looked and first saw the throne of Christ, he saw what? A newly slain lamb. A lamb as if it had been slain. The very word new means fresh slain meat. Well, look, everybody knows that old meat smells. It's bad. It'll kill you. That's law. It does smell 
ultimately and will kill you ultimately. But our Lord in his sacrifice is never old. He never stale. Always for, and I believe when I first see him, I just may see the same thing. Amen. A newly slain lamb. Amen. Amen. Now, I got to tell you, when I contrast the new way with the old way, the picture becomes clear to me. In this 10th chapter of Hebrews, listen to the old way. For this reason, it can never by the same sacrifices, repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again, offering the same sacrifices, and never takes away sin. You talk about something that get old. That's the old way. Amen. I challenge you to go home. Uh, you don't have to go home. You can do it at lunch. Take the second chapter of Corinthians, the fifth chapter, second book of Corinthians, the fifth chapter. Only 21 verses. You read that. It's a summation of everything I've said today. You read that and then you come and look Brother Leon in the eye. And even if you've read it 10,000 times, Tell me it wasn't fresh. Tell me it wasn't fresh. And if you can tell me it wasn't fresh, you're an atom. By the fruits you shall know them. It is fresh. It's like it's the first time, no matter how many times. It is just glorious to read the summation of the new and the living way. I could have read that and left it with you. But maybe I should have. We read that this way inspires confidence. Please tell me why people are unsure about their salvation. Please tell me why that people come to me and say, God doesn't seem very close. Please tell me why that people tell me weekly, Brother Leon, my prayers are not being answered. These and all of the problems have the same cause. You just like Lot's wife, you look back to Sodom. If that's being too hard, I can at least say you've looked back to Adam you have taken on yourself the old man again. Mm -hmm. You're looking back at the old creation. You're not looking at the new creation. Mm -hmm. In the old creation, you look at your sin. You see, they looked at the sin day after day, year after year, focused on the sin. How about in the new way? Why you focus on the salvation that has been given to you Amen. and the forgiveness of sin. Amen. Oh, people do suffer. Have you ever thought about looking at the suffering of Christ rather than your suffering? Sure, we suffer loss in this world. Have you ever thought about that he give up everything? Not only then, but for eternity. He will be subject to the Father. We gloat sometimes about our weakness. I'm tired of people. They either moan or gloat. And I don't like either one of them. Have you thought about looking at his strength? See, that's the difference in the old way and the new way. How is it, Paul says, that now that you're known all by God, you can turn back to the weak and beggarly elements of the world or the miserable elements of the old creation? Now, it's very interesting here that Paul's solution to this was, well, we've got to go through the pains of childbirth again. Till Christ be formed in you, you have gone back to the old creation. You are not the new man. We must form you again. 
I don't want her once saved, always saved, brother, and think about that. Maybe I'll just try it on them. <laughs> Let's keep Christ formed in us. In conclusion, and my time is up, I want to say one word about the prophets. God didn't do anything without telling them about it. Amen. He couldn't hide this from Abraham. He couldn't hide it from his prophets. They didn't understand it to the extent that you and I can. But they wrote a lot about it. Amen. Amen. If they wrote about the new way, I suspect they were asked to write about the new way. If they were asked to write about the new way, I think I better read about the new way. Amen. And I honor the prophets, who I don't know of one of them, that had a high-paying TV job. I don't even know one of them that had a good, well-paying minister's job from the pulpit in an air-conditioned building. As a matter of fact, most of them. Can you think about prophesying three years naked that you could understand what God was talking about? Can you think about having to marry a prostitute and love her and have children by her and see her leave you and continually play the harlot again so that you could understand how God felt about his wayward children? I honor the prophets who talked about this way. And every one of them talked about this way. And when you read them, you look for this way. And can you say with me, I am cross crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives within me. That is the practical implication and the definitive statement of a new and living way. God bless you.